I'm Brooke with Motor and TV. I'm here with Bill from Chevrolet Performance. Uh, we're here discussing if you can carry it, you can keep it on the crate engines. Uh, which is the biggest one you think I could carry out of here? Oh, that 572 go, should be. Go straight for the 572? Right on your shoulder. Right on the shoulder? No problem. All right, awesome. Yeah. So you guys have launched the, the LT5 engine uh, recently. What can you tell us about it? I mean, benefits, you know, over the previous generations? Well, the, Z, the ZR1 uh, Corvette, which is the, uh, the hottest of the hot of, yeah. the, of the C7s, has the LT5. Now, it's a supercharged uh, 6.2 liter Gen 5 engine, okay. so it means it's direct injected along with supercharged. The bottom line is the wow factor is 755 horsepower. Out of the crate, two year warranty. So for wow. this market, that level of power is just insane at, 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 a, at a very attractive price, right about 20 grand. What can you tell me about fuel system requirements for dropping a direct injected engine in, you know, for like a crate swap? Um, I, I've read a little bit about it in the past, and it seemed like the, they were like pressurized fuel systems. They're a little bit different. Um, the, there's kind of a two-part answer to that, and I, I'm not engineering fluent in that, but the direct injection engines uh, have a cam-driven fuel pump underneath the intake manifold, Okay. Uh, actually underneath the, either the intake or the supercharger. As such, they don't require, it's a very high pressure pump. It's like 20, 2,500 PSI. Sure. As such, all it requires is a regular pump to get the fuel up to the engine. So 60, 70 pounds roughly, okay. the fuel gets to the engine. That pump then becomes a multiplier and takes it up to the over 2,000 PSI. Okay, so that's how you guys overcome the high pressure requirements that's, by having it basically built onto the engine itself. Yeah, the, the pump okay. itself is, and I'm, again, I'm not engineering fluent, but it's very similar to a diesel pump. Okay. And it's a mechanical pump uh, cam driven, so uh, it's in that regards it's not real high tech, but uh, of course the injectors and everything along with it are very high tech. Okay. okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> you uh, you guys have the Copo program. Now can you explain to me a little bit about that because I'm not as knowledgeable about the Copo program, sure. but I understand that you can go in, in, to the factory yourself and 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 help build the engines. Not quite. Uh, so Maybe me, I'm crossing my channels on that a little bit. Well, nice that, try. Is, but it's why I'm asking. Nice I, try. I kind of wanted an invitation. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so here, here's kind of the overview. The COPO program goes back to, uh, if you don't happen to have the history, it was a central office production order. Okay. COPO. And it was originated in 1968-69, and we had some very enterprising dealers that figured out how to special order a 427 at that time, a ZL1 or an L88, yeah. to be installed in a production car that didn't really have that option. Gotcha. So at that point in time, there were 69, 69 Camaros built with the ZL1 big block. That became known in the aftermarket as the Copo. Okay. Now there are other cars, uh, there were central office production orders for Novas, uh, a couple Chevelles, even a couple full-size cars. But the car that really resonates today as Copo is the Camaro. Well, let me, let me ask you something, yeah. and, and, and to make sure I'm clear on it. Uh, the Copo would essentially be a factory car. So like the Yenkos, those were like the dealers adding options on Absolutely. At, at, at the dealership. So that's a completely different animal that's than the right. Copo. Okay. That's right. The dealer, that was a dealer installed engine option. Okay. This, this is done in a low volume, this car, the current Copo, is done in a low volume production plant that is a General Motors plant. And they, the customer has the choice of two or three engine options, either normally aspirated or supercharged. Not the LT engine, but a custom built Copo engine. Okay. And so according to what he checks on the box, uh, he, he gets that engine installed and delivered complete as a complete drivetrain. Do, do all three of those options come with the Magnus and supercharger on them? No. No, the two of the engines are normally aspirated, okay. and uh, uh, one's a 427, and one is a uh, uh, 6.2, I believe, and the third engine is the 350, which is the supercharged motor. Supercharged, so it, okay. it's technically a 5.7, but 350 with the uh, the uh, large Magnuson on it. Okay, okay. What, for, for let's say a home builder, 
What, what's the biggest advantage to jumping over to a crate rather than building a pre-existing block? Well, there's several things. Uh, you know what you get. Everything that we have is new components. Okay. So a lot of the aftermarket is uh, centered around, if you will, recycled junkyard blocks. And I'm not saying they're not cleaned and machined, but they are used. So our, our stuff is 100% uh, new. And as such, uh, you don't have to worry about any minute cracks that might not show up. Uh, in the inspection process, uh, plus when we put it all together, it's got a two-year, uh, 24,000 uh, mile warning. Is that whether you street it or track it flat? Well, the track, no, not, not, <laughs> not, nice try. Uh, so anything that's raced, you know, there are some parameters. Yeah. So, for example, the circle track engines behind me are purpose-built race engines, no warning. Okay. The Copo engines, purpose-built drag race engine, no warning. The DR525, no warranty. So anything that's used and intended for competition only does not have a GM warning. Okay. okay, very good. We don't know what kind of conditions the engine's gonna see, what kind of maintenance it might have, so we just can't assume that risk. Okay, well, I know that you can't talk about the Silverados with the new lift kit packages and the ZR2, but is there anything else crate engine-wise that's more in your wheelhouse that you want to share with us and with our viewers today? Well, definitely. Uh, you know, this business is all about what's new uh, every year. So, you know, we have a full portfolio of engines behind us here, but the other thing that's new is that we've taken the 350, you know, and taken it from the Stone Age yeah. dinosaur, if you will. Still a good engine but uh, brought it up to uh, current technology with a EFI program. Okay. So we have a ZZ6, which we have available as a carburetor engine, and we've now added a deluxe and a turnkey version of that with throttle body EFI. Uh, the turnkey, for those that might not be familiar, is simply the base engine with the complete front dress on it. Okay. okay. So turnkey doesn't include harness, electronic gas pedal, things of that nature. It, okay. No, not in terms of the, the uh, EFI, if you will, Gen 4, Gen 5 engines have a separate kit, which is throttle body, O2 sensors, uh, controllers, harness. Okay. That's a separate kit to, to run that engine. Okay. So that's really not part of turnkey, uh, okay. but the turnkey is primarily a designation we used on the Gen 1 small block and big block. Okay. So it was making it easy for the guy that didn't have all that front stuff, sure. alternator, power steering, all that. Uh, we kit it and include that uh, in the crate. Air, uh, air conditioning? And air conditioning, wow. yes. Yeah. Because you got to have that. Got to have it. Yeah. Very good. Awesome. Anything else that, that you can think of that you'd like to share with us? Well, or any, uh, any new products you guys I, have launched this year? I guess I would just say that you know we're we're always looking at constant improvement. So, contrary to rumors that get going in the market, uh, GM Chevrolet performance is in this for the long haul, yeah. and we're going to continue building 350s. We're going to continue building big blocks, and certainly LS LT engines for the foreseeable future. So, if anybody has heard, hey. Somebody said, I'm just telling you that we're going to be in this for a long time to come. Okay. Well, you know, before we started videotaping, we mentioned the eCopo uh, crate engine concept. If you had to guess how long it would take for that concept to become a reality with the way everything's going to electric now, if you had to guess, not holding you to the iron or anything, or maybe I am, but you are just curious if yeah. you, it, it, what your thoughts are as a, as a you know, working with GM and what, what you think about that. Well, the company is very public in that our CEO has said GM is all in for electric future. Yeah. Now, there is not a definite date attached to the timeline, so I, I'm not giving you a weasel answer, but the answer is nobody knows yet. Okay. So I'm not even going to venture a guess as a special motorsports type powertrain I guess you could say the, the development has already been done. Yeah. I don't know about any durability, but the, the development. So we would have to run through a durability cycle. Uh, that, that alone would probably take at least a year. Yeah. So 
I think at, at the at the very earliest, and I'm I'm really being super optimistic. We're looking at, at at a minimum of two to three years out, and honestly, I think it's further out than that. Okay. So we need to wait a little while before we get our pre-orders in. I we'll let you know. Uh, okay. We'll put you on that list, but right. uh, uh, it, it was well received at SEMA. Uh, at, from a technology standpoint, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. Uh, whether it's practical or, uh, or not for the masses, we don't know. Yeah. Time will tell. Time will tell. Thank you very much. Okay. Very GM good. Performance on Motor and TV. We're going to be picking some crate inches up soon for some of our projects. And okay. I'll be calling you for some advice. I'm okay. Sure. Thank we, you very much. That's the cheapest thing we have. So. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Appreciate it.